He was a writer of speculative philosophy. He was one of the first to see the cylinder, which he called the thing. First there were blasts from Mars, then a strange cylinder crashed near Horsell Common. Men and women came for curiosity, and others to help the men they thought were in the cylinder. He was one of the curious. He assured his wife they were safe from the Martians, but he whisked her to safety to her cousins in Leatherhead. Then he got caught in it. He didn't see his wife again until it was over. This is his story. A story of war. A story of survival. A story of awakening. H.G. Wells took some inspiration for his novel, The War of the Worlds, from two astronomical so-called discoveries in the late 1800s. These so-called discoveries happened when Mars was at opposition to Earth. Though this happens about every two years, the one around 1877 and the one in 1894 caught the attention of the world. During the 1877 opposition, an Italian astronomer, Giovanni Schiarpelli, said he saw something called canali on Mars. Somehow this was mistranslated to the word canals in English rather than channels. Channels are natural waterways, whereas canals are man-made waterways. The idea of canals led to a lot of speculation that there was life on Mars. Years later, scientists were able to photograph Mars and found that the canali Scarapelli saw were just optical illusions. In addition, in July 1894, the astronomer Stefan Javel of the Nice Observatory said he noticed a light projection from Mars. With these two discoveries, Wells found the antagonist for his story. All right, so now let's talk about the story. We have a man whose name we never learn, recounting the story of a Martian invasion that occurred six years earlier. The narrator seems to be somewhat of a Martian apologist. Now, this could be his speculative philosophy coming into play, but he tells us before we think it's bad that Martians come here to steal our planet from us, we should think about how humans did the exact same thing to other humans and lower life forms on Earth, like the bison, the dodo, and the Tasmanians. So maybe we shouldn't complain so much. The story itself is broken up into two books. Book one has 17 chapters and book two has 10 chapters. The storyline kind of jumps around a little bit, and it also includes a couple of chapters about the narrator's brother, whose name we also don't know. I don't feel like following these jumps in the timeline, so instead of talking about the story starting in book one, chapter one, chapter two, and moving forward, I'm going to tell the story starting with the first event to the last. As I tell the story, I'll provide dates. Now, these dates may not be completely accurate because in some cases I had to guess because the story doesn't say the dates. It just gives time frames and you have to infer what those dates are. August 12th, 1894. This is really when the story starts. Although people on Earth, including the narrator, didn't know it at the time. Around midnight, the astronomer Lavelle saw a gas plume from Mars. The narrator tells us newspapers didn't write about this incident, save for one little note in one paper. August 13, 1894, near midnight. The narrator finds out about the flash on the previous day from his friend, astronomer Ogilvy. Hey, a person with a name. I guess I shouldn't complain about the lack of names in the story because most all of the people who get names wind up dying. Ogilvy invited him to look at Mars through his telescope. They saw a second flash like the one described by Lavelle. Turns out they saw another one the next night, around midnight as well. Now the newspapers finally took notice. Ogilvy and the narrator talked about what these flashes might mean. Ogilvy thought it was absurd to think Mars was communicating with Earth. Instead, he thought maybe there were meteorites hitting Mars or volcanic eruptions. He thought it was quite unlikely there were man-like creatures on Mars. August 15th through the 21st, near midnight each night. There were seven more nights of these flashes, then nothing. There were 10 flashes in all, and then they stopped. Then an unknown amount of time elapses from the flashes. Week one, a Thursday. One morning, a falling star appeared rushing over in Winchester eastward. The narrator speculates that hundreds must have seen it, but just assumed it was an ordinary falling star. Later that morning, Ogilvy was the only person who looked for what fell to earth. He found it lodged in the ground in a huge impact crater. The top of the cylinder was slowly turning, and he was now convinced that this thing came from Mars and that there is indeed some kind of intelligent life there. He ran back to town to get help for the creatures and enlisted the help of a local journalist named Henderson. When they returned to the cylinder, they heard no noises, so they returned to town to get more help. 
Back at town, Henderson sent a telegraph to London about the cylinder. Around 9 a.m., the narrator went to the common and found about 20 people looking at the huge hole where the cylinder lay. The narrator climbed into the pit and thought he heard faint noises, but the screw had stopped turning. He also decided this thing must have come from Mars, but unlike Ogilvy, he didn't think there were creatures in it. By 11 a.m., nothing seemed to be happening at the cylinder, so the narrator decided to go home. But at home, he couldn't focus his mind on what he had to do, so he went back to the common. By the afternoon, when he went back to the pit, he saw that Ogilvy and Henderson had also returned. They had also brought a man named Stent, who was the Astronomer Royal, with them. Stent was directing several workmen to uncover the cylinder. Ogilvy asked the narrator to go to Lord Hilton to request a light railing be put up to keep the growing crowd away from the pit so they could excavate. This was a bit of an ego lift for the narrator, because he was now part of the privileged spectators. Around sundown, the narrator returned to the pit to find chaos. The crowd had grown to about two to three hundred by now. The crowd had forced a shop assistant from Woking to the top of the cylinder. The top of the cylinder screw came off and the crowd got very excited. Was this thing in the cylinder a man like us? Most of the crowd suddenly ran out of the pit, leaving the narrator almost alone in it. The narrator was frozen with fear when a glistening grayish bulk slowly pulled itself up out of the cylinder and looked directly at the narrator. Then, plop, it fell out of the cylinder, but a second one emerged from the cylinder. The narrator managed to collect himself and ran staggeringly toward the first group of trees. At the trees, he turned to see what was happening. The shopman couldn't get out of the pit and he would climb up and then drop down several times until eventually he dropped down, disappeared into the pit, and then there was a faint shriek. He stared with great fascination. In the shadow of the sunset, he could see thin, black, whip-like arms come up over the pit. He and the crowd were very curious as to what the creatures were doing in the pit. Near sundown, people started slowly and carefully approaching the pit again. Ogilvy, Henderson, and Stent brought flags to use to communicate with the creatures. With the crowd now surrounding the pit, the Martians used their heat ray for the first time. Everything within range of the heat ray lit up on fire instantly. Ogilvy, Henderson, Stent, and others who were near them were all swept out of existence. The narrator expected to get caught up in the heat ray too, but somehow he was spared. Then the heat ray stopped and the Martians went back into the pit. The narrator, gripped with terror, began running and weeping silently like a child. He dared not look back at the scene behind him. Stent and Ogilvy anticipated some struggle with the Martians, so they sent a telegraph to the military as soon as the Martians emerged. Then they returned to the pit for their eventual fate. That night, the narrator finally made it home, where he told his wife what had happened. She was sufficiently frightened by what he said, but he told her it was okay that they couldn't get out of the pit. And if they had to, the military could shell the pit and kill all of them tomorrow. Then he and his wife ate dinner. Week one, Friday. People went about their daily activities. They didn't know how bad things were, in part because Ogilvy and Henderson were dead, so the newspapers couldn't confirm the information they had sent. By 11 p.m., two companies of soldiers set up along the edge of the common. The narrator found out earlier that day that a Major Eden went to the common, but never returned. Around midnight, people saw another falling star fall in the pine woods near the northwest. This was the second cylinder. Week one, Saturday. The townspeople were talking about the Martians, but no fear was detected. They seemed to believe that the military would take care of the creatures. This was the day the narrator's brother first heard about the Martians. The younger brother was a medical student in London. He was busy prepping for an exam, so the news he saw about the first attack at the pit in Horsell Common didn't really concern him much. After all, the cylinder was two miles away from the narrator's house. After breakfast, the narrator walked down to the nearby common where he ran into some soldiers. He told them what he saw, and they were fascinated. After a while, he left the soldiers and he went to the rail station to gather some newspapers. In London, the brother bought the afternoon news, but it didn't really provide much information other than troop movements. A special edition in the evening papers, though, mentioned that communications with Woking had been lost. 
By 3 p.m., the military started shelling the second pit, and this could be heard from the narrator's town. Around 4 p.m., the narrator got the evening papers because the morning papers were full of inaccuracies. Meanwhile, the Martians stayed in the pit at the common, hammering away. The little brother still wasn't terribly concerned. However, he did decide to go down that evening to see the things before the military killed them. He sent a telegram to his brother around 4 and then went to the music hall. Since the telegraph communication is gone, of course his brother didn't get this. Around 6 p.m., the fighting at the second cylinder was too close to the narrator's house, and something hit the chimney, causing a piece of it to fall to the ground. At this point, the narrator and his wife realized they shouldn't stay there. They decided that his wife should go to her cousin's in Leatherhead. The narrator paid an innkeeper two pounds to borrow his dog cart and promised to bring it back by midnight. Then he packed the dog cart, gave his servant some things that she had wanted from the house, checked on the neighbors to make sure they were gone, and then they were off. In front of the dog cart, it was quiet and sunny. Behind the dog cart, it was dark and scary. The Martians seemed to be using the heat ray on everything within its range. They made it to Leatherhead, where he left his wife with her cousin's family. He would have stayed if it weren't for the promise he made to the innkeeper. When the little brother left for Woking that night, he encountered a nasty storm, and the cab he tried to take could only get to Waterloo. He then tried the train, but found out that there was some kind of accident that stopped the trains from going to Woking. Still, this didn't seem to worry the younger brother, so he went home. Around 11 p.m., the narrator set back to Mayberry. The war fever had gotten into him, and he wasn't completely sad that he had to go back, though his wife was very not happy. It was unexpectedly dark that evening, and there were times when he was in complete darkness. Around midnight, the narrator passed Pyreford Church and then came to Mayberry Hill. Then came the third falling star, and the horse took the bit between his teeth and bolted. The storm the brother was experiencing came to the narrator, too. It was the worst storm the narrator had ever experienced. There was blinding lightning and lots of hail. He was struggling with driving the dog cart when he saw a monstrous tripod towering over the houses and trees. It smashed anything in its path. Then he saw a second tripod seeming heading straight for him. In that instant, the narrator wrenched the horse's head hard to the right. The narrator crashed the dog cart and he was hurled sideways and fell into a shallow pool of water. He stood in the water, crouching behind some shrubbery as the tripod moved past him. After a while, he continued on and finally made it home. He crouched at the foot of the staircase with his back to the wall, shivering violently. The narrator drank some whiskey and then changed his clothes and went to a study so that he could watch the creatures in the pit. Soon he discovered a man outside and invited him in the house. This man was an artilleryman who encountered the Martians. The Martians used their heat ray on the soldiers, and he was the only survivor. Then the Martians shut off their heat rays and turned their attention to the pit of the second cylinder. It was at this point the artilleryman decided to go to London, where he found himself at the narrator's house. Week 1, Sunday. The men decided to head toward London. The narrator wanted to go to his wife, but the third cylinder was between Mayberry and Leatherhead. The artilleryman insisted before they headed out, they needed provisions, so they got some and then headed out. The town was deserted. The people had either escaped, were dead, or were in hiding. Even the birds in the wind were in hiding. On their way to London, they talked to some cavalry soldiers about the Martians. They also encountered some soldiers who were trying to evacuate people, but were having trouble with an elderly man who wanted to keep his flower pots. Eventually, the old man decided to stay with his flower pots, then get evacuated. The men stopped for lunch at Weybridge. There were a lot of people trying to get boats to get away from the Martians, and there was a lot of chaos and some arguing. Before people could get on the boats and get away from the Martians, as much as four armored Martians appeared, then another. One raised its heat ray, and the crowd at the water's edge seemed to be horror-struck. They made no noise, no screaming or shouting just silence. After a moment, they started moving, running away, running into the water. Having encountered the heat ray Friday night, the narrator knew that the water was protection from it. He yelled for others to get into the water, but people either didn't hear or didn't heed. As he hid in the water, some artillery guns on the outskirts of the village fired at the tripods. 
The narrator got really excited seeing one of the shells hit directly on the monster's face. He yelled, HIT! But before the Martian fell, it managed to use its heat ray and destroy the artillery guns. Another Martian appeared near the narrator, so he dove back into the water and stayed there until he couldn't hold his breath any longer. Then he stood up out of the water, only to find the Martian was firing its heat ray across the water toward him. He ran out of the water, but he wasn't fast enough, and he got scalded before he could get out. He fell upon the ground, expecting the Martians to kill him. Instead, the Martians took their fallen comrade and left. The narrator headed toward London in spite of the great pain he was in. He found an abandoned boat and floated in it until he made it to Middlesex. He got out of the boat and lay down on the shore. He was tired, and he needed to recover from the wounds and the shock of the violence in Weybridge. In London, the little brother got news of what happened near Woking, and now he's concerned. Communications had not been restored to Woking, so the brother got every paper he could to see what kind of news he could find. He even started asking refugees in the area for information. Around 5 p.m., the narrator woke up and walked about a half mile, and then he lay down again. When he finally woke up, he found a curate sitting next to him. The curate seemed to be in shock and having some kind of crisis of faith. The narrator tried to help him, but eventually realized this was futile. He told the curate that they were in the middle of the fighting and they needed to leave. Around 8 p.m., three tripods started on the move, using their heat rays on Ripley and St. George's Hill and the military. The shelling of the Martians managed to damage one of the tripods before the other Martians destroyed the gunners and blew up all the ammunition. The Martians paused their attack to repair the tripod, and by 9, it was back in action. Soon after, the three tripods were joined by four others. Now there are seven tripods. What a sight that must have been. The new Martians gave the other three some sort of black tube, so they all had one black tube each. The military started shelling the Martians as soon as the seven joined together. The Martians took up a position on the crest and became silent. After a short time of silence, the military started shelling them. The Martians set their heat rays on the soldiers and with large explosions, up in smoke went the ammunition and many or all of the men. After some time, the Martians raised those black tubes and fired them. The narrator was expecting to see explosions or smoke. Instead, he saw nothing, just blue sky. Then the Martians were on the move. This time there was no shelling or artillery. The Martians left unthreatened. After the Martians left, a black smoke started rising in the air. It turns out the tubes fired canisters that released this black smoke. It was sort of like tear gas, but instead of irritating the eyes and the skin, it kills anyone who breathes it. That night, the Martians fired these canisters instead of their heat rays. Sunday was the last organized fight against the invaders. The military had given up as an institution. After this, the fighting became sporadic and local. That night, the fourth cylinder crashed in Bushy Park in London. Speaking of London, the younger brother was in a spot in South London when he could hear faint sounds of fighting. He went home and tried to divert his attention from the Martians by studying for his tests. He went to bed worried about his brother, but he was awoken in the middle of the night from loud movements in the streets and red flickering lights. People started coming out in the streets to meet a lot of confusion. The younger brother ran out to the streets and found a boy selling a newspaper. They seemed to be always selling newspapers. The paper gave little information, but what it said was frightening. Londoners now realize how much in danger they were. He went back to his room to grab what money he had, and he ran back out into the streets. Before dawn on Monday, the government had started trying to evacuate London. By Monday morning, back at the empty house in Halliford, where the narrator and the curate fled from the black smoke, they were forced to stay there Sunday night and all day Monday. The narrator claims to be concerned for his wife. He thinks she probably thinks he's dead. He tells us his cousin is brave, but is slow to figure out when there is danger. And he also complained about the curate and said he went to different rooms to avoid him. The narrator watched a Martian use superheated steam to clear the black smoke. With the smoke clearing, the narrator had the idea that he could leave and try to get to his wife. But the curate didn't want to go. He learned from the artillery man, so he gathered some food, a hat, a shirt to wear, 
and some supplies for the burns before heading out. When it was clear the narrator was leaving, the curate reluctantly went with him. Back in London, the Londoners were trying their darndest to get out. Sunday night, the trains were filled with people. But as Monday wore on, the train drivers refused to return to London. The younger brother was desperate, and when a mob broke into a bicycle store, he participated and absconded with a bike. The bike tire got punctured as he attempted to pull it through a window, but he rode out of the city with it anyway. About a mile just south of Edgware, the wheel broke, and he was forced to go on foot. Once in Edgware, he got some food and stayed there for a while, trying to figure out what to do. Eventually, he decided to go to his friends in Chelmsford. That seems like a long way to go on foot, but that's what he decided. On the trek, he heard some screams and found some men trying to rob a couple of women. The younger brother sprang into action and took on several men. He was able to run the men off with the help of a gun one of the ladies had. Then he joined the ladies until the men they were waiting for came back. The men never showed, so eventually they decided to go north and leave the country. They started off toward Barnett. There were so many people moving on the same road that they had to travel very slowly. At times, the crowd on the road was so large that they had to push their way through. The crowd was so bad that at one point, a man was run over by another's carriage. At another point, the brother was slashed in the face and hands from a whip from somebody else on the road. That afternoon, finally, the brother and the ladies made it through the chaos and the dangers of the crowd near East Barnett. They stopped there for the rest of the afternoon. They were exhausted from the fight through the crowds. They were hungry and cold as the night came on, but no one dared to sleep. People were fleeing from the area where they were going, heading to where they left. The brother and the ladies knew where they were going may not be any safer than where they'd been. In Twickenham, the narrator and the curate saw people for the first time that day. Apparently, it was spared from the smoke and the heat rays of the Martians. The other people they encountered were like them. They didn't know anything, and they were just trying to change locations to hide from the Martians. The older brother tells us of the destruction from the Martians. They blew up all the armaments, cut telegraph lines, and wrecked railways. Around 8.30 p.m., the men continued on. They saw the black smoke had killed many people. As they approached Q, a number of people were running. A Martian could be seen over the rooftops, not quite 100 yards from them. They suddenly realized the danger they were in. If the Martian used their heat ray at that point, they would be killed instantly. So they hid in a garden shed. The immediate danger got the narrator thinking about Leatherhead. By twilight, the men left and ran along the side of a house towards Q. They saw a Martian pick up four or five people, one by one, and toss them into a metallic carrier on the back of the tripod. After a moment of watching this, they ran to a ditch and stayed there for some time. It was nearly 11 p.m. when they started again. As they moved, they encountered dead bodies, where the heads and the trunks were badly burned, but the legs and the boots were mostly intact. They got to Sheen, and like Twickenham, Sheen seemed to have escaped the Martians' destruction, though it was kind of dark, so they really couldn't tell. They decided to try to find some shelter, and they stopped at one house, but it had little provisions except for some water and a hatchet. So they moved on, and on a road towards Mortlake, they found a white house with a garden wall. This house had a well-stocked pantry, which was good for the men, as they didn't know it yet, but they would be stuck there for the next two weeks. Sometime before midnight, something caused the house to shudder, and glass broke everywhere, there was falling masonry, and the ceiling fell on the men and their surroundings. The narrator was flung across the kitchen, slamming into the oven handle. He was out of it for a while, and when he came to, the curate was dabbing water on him, in spite of his head dripping with blood. The floor was littered with debris, and the men dare not move or breathe, for fear the Martians would hear them. They could hear lots of metal rattling outside. The narrator thinks one of the tripods must have slammed into the house. Week 1, the house day 1, Tuesday. By daybreak, a beam shone through a hole in the wall, and the men could see the utter destruction of the house. Much of the house had collapsed, and dangerous debris was everywhere. Through the hole, they could see a Martian, so they carefully and quickly crawled out of the kitchen and into the scullery. The narrator realized it was not a tripod that fell on the house, but the fifth cylinder. In the scullery, the men stayed quiet, except for the curate praying quietly, while the Martians started building their things. 
After some hours, the narrator became too hungry to hide anymore. He crawled into the kitchen and found something to eat. The curate stayed at first, but he got hungry and soon crawled to the food as well. By now, the fifth and sixth cylinders came, with the sixth landing in Wimbledon. People were becoming desperate for food and willing to ignore private property and just take what they needed. Some were so desperate that they were willing to actually go back to London. The younger brother and the ladies moved toward Colchester, hoping to get across the sea. They got confirmation that the Martians had now taken complete control of London. They too were very hungry, and they had heard that if they stayed there, that the next day there would be free bread for everyone, but they decided to push on rather than wait. After eating, the narrator looked at the curate and found him hiding near the hole in the wall and looking out. So he crawled over to the curate, and the two sat there for a while. But then the narrator saw another horizontal slit, and so he crawled over to that one. When he looked out, he saw that the fifth cylinder slammed directly into the house that they had went to first. The cylinder completely obliterated that house and came to rest deep in the ground, creating a vastly larger pit than the one at Woking. He also saw that the two floors of the front of the house they were in had collapsed. Somehow the kitchen and scullery had managed to survive, but it's buried by the earth that was pushed up out from the cylinder crash. The cylinder was already open and an unoccupied tripod stood far at the edge of the pit. Then the narrator saw a new machine called a handling machine. The narrator couldn't stop watching it for a long time. He was able to note some things about the Martians from his observations. He could tell they were indefatigable, 24 hours of work in 24-hour days. They had huge round heads that doubled as their bodies. They had a face and very large, dark colored eyes. They had no nostrils and one ear that was on the back of the head. They didn't eat. Instead, they took fresh living blood of other creatures and injected it directly into their veins. Apparently, blood obtained from a still living animal, in most cases a human being, was run directly by means of a little pipette into the recipient canal. Apparently, the Martians also brought creatures of their own to feed on, and those were bipeds just like humans. In addition to bringing their own food, they brought their own plant or vegetable of some sort. It's unclear what it is. Instead of being green like our plants are on Earth, they were red and eventually they grew on earth, especially near streams. The narrator tells us that no one saw the Martians in action more than he did. He was quick to also say that it was quite accidental, you know, because he didn't want to sound like he was bragging. He determined that the hooting was part of their feeding, probably to expel air to prepare for the suction operation needed for feeding. He was convinced that the Martians communicated without physical operation. Just as the narrator was attaining great knowledge of the creatures, the curate wanted to look out the slit too. So the narrator had to wait his turn to observe the creatures again. That night, the brother and the ladies reached Chelmsford and the seventh cylinder had fallen. At Chelmsford, a group called the Committee of Public Supply took their pony for provisions and offered to let them eat part of it the next day. As hungry as they were, they chose to move on rather than to wait. Week 1, The House Day 2, Wednesday The appearance of the second tripod made the men fear being found, so they retreated to the scullery. Eventually they feared less and started to return to the slit. They took turns looking through the slit. The narrator takes some time to pontificate on how bad the curate was. They had different dispositions and ways to think, and the isolation they were in accentuated these differences. The narrator complained that the curate's mumbling kept him from thinking about a plan for them to get out. The curate wept for hours, and the narrator thought, like a spoiled child, the curate thought his behavior would help him in some way. The curate ate and drank more than he should, even though the narrator warned him that they needed to ration their food. And as much as the narrator loathed the idea, or at least that's what he claimed, he had to, at times, use physical persuasion over the curate. He finally stopped complaining about the curate so he could go back to look at the Martians. The curate was looking through the slit when one of the Martians probably ate a human. He dropped below the slit and started gesticulating and making noises that the narrator couldn't understand, but panicked him anyway. After a while, the narrator went to the slit. He saw a man lifted up out of the cage and disappeared behind the mound. There was silence, and then shrieking followed by hooting from the Martians. The narrator, horrified by what he saw, ran into the scullery. The curate cried out of fear when the narrator deserted him, and then he went running too. The narrator now felt an urgent need to do something, so he started working on a plan for escape. 
The narrator was thinking their best chance would be for the Martians to just leave, or at least guard the pit a little bit less. He considered the idea of digging a tunnel out of the area. By midday, the brother and the ladies passed Tillingham, where it was strangely quiet. Then they could see the sea in all sorts of boats, including an ironclad, a few miles out. By 2 p.m., the boats were getting big bucks to take people out of the area. It's unclear if they were charging people for that or if people were just offering. Probably a little bit of both. People started swimming out to the boats to get on board, but the people on the boats were pushing them off with boat hooks, causing many of them to drown. Mrs. Ethelstone was panicking because she's never left England and seems to want to take her chances with the Martians rather than the French. In spite of her protestations, the younger brother managed to bargain for the three of them to get passage for 36 pounds, which is somewhere around $1,900 today. The steamer was headed for Ostend in Belgium. The steamer stayed by the shore until about 5 p.m. to get as much money, I mean as many passengers as possible. The steamer was overcrowded, maybe dangerously overcrowded. In spite of that, the group felt safe on the ship. The ship may have stayed a little bit longer to get more money, I mean passengers, if it weren't for the sound of guns in the distance. As the steamer set off, wouldn't you know it, Martians appeared. The captain was mad at himself now for delaying so long. The steamer worked hard for the slow movement it was making. The younger brother got sight of the Martians for the first time, and he was mesmerized. He was so focused on them that he didn't brace himself when the ship lurched to avoid colliding with another ship. With the ship bouncing around in the energetic waves, the younger brother fixed his footing and then watched the Martians head toward the sea, and the ironclad, Thunderchild, headed toward them to engage in battle. The Thunderchild held their guns and went straight for the tripods. A Martian fired its black smoke canister at the ironclad, but it kept coming. The tripod fired its heat ray at the ironclad, immediately heating the water. Then the ironclad rammed the tripod, and it started firing its guns. The tripod went down. Everyone on the steamer cheered. Then the ironclad set its sights on the second tripod. It barreled toward the tripod, but the tripod was not going to make the mistake of the other one, and it fired its heat ray. The ironclad exploded in a fury. Unfortunately for the tripod, the ironclad was too close, and the explosion took it out too. Everyone cheered again. The little steamer with the younger brother and the ladies kept moving away from shore until the coast was indistinguishable. The night came and there were vibrations from guns and then some kind of alien flying machine sailed by them in the sky. Presumably the three got away and were safe because that's the last mention of the brother. Week two, the house day three, Thursday. On this day, the narrator actually saw the Martians feed on a man. The narrator was mortified and avoided the slit for almost a day. He started silently digging with the hatchet, but after a couple of feet, the loose dirt collapsed noisily. He knew not to continue and lost hope of escaping that way. Week two, the house day four or five, Friday or Saturday. It was very late in the night and the pit seemed deserted except for one tripod and a handling machine. The pit was dark save for the pale glow from the handling machine. The narrator heard six booming gun sounds, and after a long interval, six more. Then, nothing. Week two, the house days six to ten, Sunday to Thursday. Over the next several days, not much was happening with the Martians, which allowed the men to focus on each other. The curate kept eating and drinking too much and refused to ration the food. The narrator became quite annoyed by the curate. At times, their disagreements about the food became physical. Everything culminated on day nine when the curate became out of control, threatening to get the Martian's attention and becoming louder in speech and action. The narrator was scared of the horrors the curate was going to bring down on them, and so he grabbed a meat cleaver and went after the curate. He used the butt of the cleaver to hit the curate, and he fell headlong onto the ground. Apparently, one of the handling machines heard the commotion, and two of its limbs entered the kitchen through the hole in the wall and started feeling around the debris. Then, a snake-like tentacle started coming through the hole. The narrator stood petrified. After some effort, he stumbled over the curate and went to the scullery. As he did, he fell and could barely stand upright. He opened a coal cellar door, not knowing if the Martian had heard him or seen him. He could hear movements from the tentacle. It dragged the curate across the kitchen floor. The narrator peeked out and found the handling machine investigating the curate's head. He was afraid the Martians would be able to sense his presence, 
So he crept back to the coal cellar and hid himself under firewood and coal, occasionally listening for what the Martians were doing. After some silence, he could hear the tentacle again. It made its way to the cellar door and fumbled with the door and came in. The tentacle searched the cellar, and at one point, it touched the narrator's boot heel, and the narrator had to bite his hand to keep from screaming. After some time of investigating, it left the cellar. The narrator hid in the cellar for almost two days until he was sure that it was safe to come out. Week 3, the house days 11 to 14, Friday to Monday. After leaving the cellar, the narrator went into the pantry and found all the food was gone. He had no food or drink. He also noticed that the noise in the pit had ceased, but he was too weak to go to the slit to see what was going on. On the twelfth day, he was desperate, so he drank two glasses of blackened, tainted rainwater. He was surprised the tentacle didn't appear from the noise he was making. By day 14, the red weed that the Martians brought with them had grown in the kitchen. Week 3, the house day 15, Tuesday. A dog entered the house and surprised the narrator. The dog barked at him. He thought he could kill the dog and eat the dog, but even if he didn't eat the dog, he still had to kill the dog because he didn't want it to attract the Martians. As he tried to get the dog to come in, it backed out of the hole and disappeared. For a while, he lay near the hole, afraid to move. He heard nothing but the sounds of nature. After some time, he looked out of the hole and found nothing alive in the pit. He emerged from the house, and it looked like it was his chance to escape. He started to tremble, but he climbed out of the mound that the house was buried in and made his way up to the street. He saw that the red weed had grown all around and the surrounding trees were dead. He stood there for some time looking around. He expected to find Sheen in ruins, but the red weed made the surroundings look more like another planet. He saw a field of green past the red weed. Hoping to find some food over there, he moved through the six foot high red weed, using it as cover. There he found some young onions and carrots. He grabbed them up and headed toward Q. As he moved toward Q, he found some mushrooms and devoured them immediately, but this only made him more hungry. He noticed that the red weed died as quickly as it spread. He said that it died from bacteria that wasn't on Mars. Presumably, this is something he learned later on. He made his way to some water where he drank as much as he could handle, and out of curiosity, he gnawed on some of the red weed. He thought it was watery and had a metallic taste. At Putney Common, the landscape finally changed from some other strange planet to the expected ruins. As he moved along, he saw no people or Martians, only skeletons from humans and animals and a couple of hungry dogs. By sunset Tuesday, beyond Roehampton, he managed to find some potatoes that finally took care of his hunger. Silence was everywhere, and it filled the narrator with terror to think how quickly things changed. He wondered if he may be the last man alive, and he thought maybe the Martians had moved on to France or Germany. Tuesday night, the narrator stayed in Putney Hill Inn, where he found some food. He tried to sleep, but he had trouble relaxing, thinking about the curate, the whereabouts of the Martians, and his wife. Wondering about his wife, he prayed that the heat ray may have suddenly and painlessly struck her out of existence. Uh, maybe that's how some people would feel, but I would hope more like she was spared from the heat ray and was still alive. The end of week three, beginning of week four, Wednesday through Sunday. The next morning, he thought about going to Leatherhead, though he thought he wouldn't find his wife there unless she had died. Earlier, he told us his cousin was slow to respond and that he was sure his wife was dead, but now he thinks maybe she's fled. Which is it, dead or fled? He comes across as a little too easy to give up on his wife. Anyway, he believed if he went there, he wouldn't find where they had gone. He really wanted to find his wife, but he didn't know where to begin, so he just gave up and went to Wimbledon Common. Near a swamp, he had a feeling he was being watched. He saw a man holding a cutlass in a clump of bushes and took a step toward him. In spite of the cutlass, he moved toward the man. The two recognized each other. It was the artillery man. Oh, so that's what happened to him. The artillery man commented that it had only been 16 days, but the narrator's hair had gone gray. They talked about what had happened while the narrator was pinned in the house. The narrator and the artillery man talked about what had happened and what they think of the situation. The artillery man explains he has an idea of how humans could survive. 
He's digging a tunnel for the able-bodied, clean-minded men and women to hide in and rebuild society. Others who were not able-bodied or clean-minded should just die as they would taint society. The artillery man shows the narrator his tunnel and the narrator thinks it's um, not that impressive and maybe the artillery man is not as put together as the narrator once thought. After dinner, the narrator left the artillery man and went toward High Street across the bridge to Fulham. The red weed was everywhere and nearly covered the bridge and road, but parts were already dying. He came across a very badly injured drunk man at Putney Bridge Station. He thought he should stay and help the man, but the man just kept cursing at him and lunging at his head, and the narrator also didn't like the brutal expression on his face. As he moved on, he saw dead bodies and destruction everywhere. Week 4, Sunday. Sunday in the city. It's quiet, deserted, and plunderers had been hard at work. All around was stillness. Near South Kensington, he heard a faint sound in the distance. It was fainter in some places and louder in others. He really wanted to know what that sound was. He couldn't see anything because of the buildings, but he eventually determined that the sound was coming from Regent's Park. It was past noon and he wandered alone in the city of the dead. He started feeling really lonely. He thought about old friends forgotten for years. Momentarily, he considered suicide. Then he broke into a public house and got food and drink, and then he slept on a sofa. Around dusk, he woke up and he could still hear the sound. So he grabbed some food and went to Regent's Park. From the top of Baker Street and over the trees, he could see one of the tripods. It was standing there howling. The Martian just seemed to be standing there yelling for no reason. The narrator moved to St. John's Wood so he could get a better view. A pack of starving dogs ran toward him, but then curved around him and continued on. The lead dog was carrying something in his mouth. As he walked halfway to St. John's Wood Station, he found a wrecked handling machine. He thought maybe it got lost from the other Martian, but it was getting dark and so he couldn't fully examine the handling machine. He also couldn't see that the dogs had gnawed on the Martian. At Primrose Hill, far away through tree gaps, he could see another Martian, motionless as well. In all the stillness and quiet, something passed him, something he didn't know, and then stillness again. The narrator's imagination started taking over and terror seized him. So he hid in a cabman's shelter in Harrow Road until after midnight. Week 4, Monday. Before dawn, he went back to Regent's Park near Primrose Hill, where he saw a third Martian standing motionless like the others. The narrator decided to commit suicide, so he marched toward that titan. As he got nearer and nearer and the sun rose, he could see birds circling and clustered on the hood. He became very excited and started running along the road. He ran up to the motionless monster and saw the birds had pecked at it. He looked around and found Martian machines littered around the mound. Some in their overturned war machines, some in the handling machines, and dozens stark and silent and laid in a row. The Martians were dead and the invasion was over. The narrator stood there looking down at the pit and his heart lifted. He believed healing would begin and people would return and life would return. He thought about his wife and their life before this and how it ceased forever. Again, he seems pretty quick to accept his wife's death. Week 4 to 5, Tuesday to Thursday. The narrator could remember everything he did that day with great detail, but he couldn't remember the next three days. During the three days the narrator doesn't remember, some people took care of him. They found him wandering around singing, The Last Man Alive, Hurrah, The Last Man Alive. I purposely didn't sing that so I wouldn't subject you to my singing. When he came out of his breakdown, he found out that two days after being stuck in the house with the curate, Leatherhead had been completely destroyed by the Martians. Great, now he's never going to look for his wife. Week 5, Friday to Monday. He spent another four days with the family that helped him until he decided to try to find his way back to his old life. Week 5, Monday. As he headed to his home in Woking, he saw some people rebuilding. At Waterloo, he found a train running and taking people to their homes for free. Well, how nice. The rails were being rebuilt near Woking, so he had to get off at Byfleet and took the road to Mayberry. He made it to his house. At first, he felt some hope, but then he saw the door was swinging open and closed, and the window to his study was left open. The storms had destroyed his carpet, and his and the artilleryman's muddied prints were still on the carpet. The house 
felt desolate. He told himself there was no need for him to stay there and torment himself about what had been. He went over to close the French doors and found his cousin and his wife. They embraced. Six years later. Okay, so he's assuming that the bacteria killed the Martians based on the writings of a guy named Carver. There was one Martian that was still intact enough for an autopsy to be performed. And in it, they found terrestrial bacteria, though it couldn't be proven definitively if the bacteria is what killed the Martians. They still don't know what the black smoke was or how the heat ray worked. The narrator worries that the Martians might return at another opposition and worries that no one else is spending enough time on this idea. He really thinks people need to be prepared for another possible invasion. The narrator also tells us that there's evidence Mars invaded Venus as well, and that maybe Mars is more focused on Venus and will leave Earth alone. The invasion from Mars shattered the illusion that humans are safe on Earth and that they are alone. It meant humans must anticipate another invasion. It furthered various areas of science. It also emphasized the idea that humans are more common than they thought. And finally, it gave humans the idea that if Martians can get to other planets and inhabit them, then it wouldn't be impossible for humans to do the same thing. 